Hi, um, we are the last speakers of the day, so we are the, hi Thor. Um, that's Thor, I'm Lane. We're the last speakers, which means I'm going to ignore that timer. Um, <laughs> it's been ready for a long night, I, I, would like to, I would like to say that today has been actually amazingly inspiring, um, but particularly it has convinced me of one thing, which is it has finally helped me figure out what it is that I want to be when I grow up, which is British. Because, <laughs> because, because when Americans get old, they just get fat on processed food and vote Republican. But apparently, when you grow old, you ride motorcycles, smoke pot, and get extraordinarily witty. <laughs> so, what I learned at TED. <laughs> Going home, I'm hiring a voice coach. I have it. So we're going to talk a little bit about a subject that we've been obsessed with for the past couple of years in various forms, and that is the role that luck plays, or what we now call serendipity, in business and in business process and business strategy. And um, the point at which I became interested personally in this subject was 2005 or 2006. Uh, we're internet entrepreneurs. We've got a bunch of startups. We hang out in the Silicon Valley web community. And uh, we were at the very first Web 2.0 conference, long before Web 2.0 had become a brand name, or really long before the internet had really made its sort of meteorized, meteor, meteoric rise um, back. Uh, and I saw an interview at this first Web 2.0 conference with really the only, with the founder, Sergey Brin, of the only company that had had any success in the years since the Web 1.0 bomb. It was a rough, rough patch. Rough patch for all of us, some of us more employed than others. and. Um, and uh, so John Battelle, who was hosting the, the Web 2.0 conference, uh, asked Sergey Brin a question. He said, what, you know, you are running what seems to be, this is 2005, 2006, so Google's predominance was well established. He said, you are running the company that seems to, you know, be creating wealth at a rate that no company has ever successfully created wealth before, as if you were minting it. What is the number one thing, what is the main thing that you would attribute your success to? And, and Sergey said, without hesitation, he goes, oh, that's easy, it was sheer dumb luck. And I was really struck by that, this idea that this sort of titan of industry, this person who arguably is one of the most successful businessmen of our era, that, that, was, that he was so willing and so ready to acknowledge that. And it actually, over the years, what we've tried to understand is, uh, what is that role? Like, if we can acknowledge that luck plays a role in business, that luck pl plays a role in life, uh, what is that role and how can we harness it? How can we not just acknowledge it, but actually create it? How can we do what we now call planned serendipity, a little bit of a contradiction in terms. How can we actually turn that into effective business strategy for us? We'll leave it up to luck. We'll just call it getting lucky. <laughs> How do we get lucky? What are the things that we need to do to get lucky? And um, to start, we want to tell you a little bit of story about breakfast. <laughs> yeah, so when you, when you try to tell the story of your life, um, it's, it's interesting to go back and try to identify those, those points at which uh, you took a different path or uh, that explained where you end up today. It's almost impossible to do it at the time that, it's had, that these events happen, but we can often retrace our steps. And so for me, and actually for us and the company we started Get Satisfaction, um, I, re I retraced our steps back to a moment in 2005, which was a really dark period for me. I had uh, moved to the suburbs um, for ungodly reasons I won't get into right now but um, felt isolated, detached, and really um, was the lowest I'd ever been in my life. So one day I up and told my wife, we were moving back to the city, we were gonna figure out a way to be part of what was clearly a renaissance for the internet, to a few of us, and, uh, and we did that. Where to start, find, find old friends who could help us. And um, so, the, long story short, I ran into Lane, who I'd only met once, it was a complete accident, and he, he told me, as soon as he heard that I wanted to start a company, you have to, you have to cohabitate your office in our office. He had a, a company with some friends that was going gangbusters, and I jumped at the chance. This, this seemed like the perfect way to get back into the stream of things. And it was, all of a sudden, overnight, from isolated to bumping into amazing minds, people I never, had never heard of before, but doing amazing projects, and, um, and discovering kind of new ways of doing things. One of the things that, that we saw that worked so well for them was this Friday afternoon tea time. Of course, being California, tea time meant drinking beer. But um, 
this was an event where their company opened up their offices to anybody in the neighborhood to come and talk about what they were working on. So we thought this was a great idea. We were being introduced to new people, new things. We wanted to put our own spin on it. But how to do that when you don't know very many people, you're, you're um, kind of the new kids on the block. Uh, we figured we needed to find a time slot that we could own, which in our case was Monday morning. We started this thing called Cereal Bar, which uh, almost overnight became a bit of a hit. We had people coming in. They were entrepreneurs, programmers, journalists, sometimes clowns. And uh, this intersection of people Thor. doing... Thor. Thor was the clown. <laughs> He's the mime, for the record. Uh, we were bouncing off the walls with new ideas, and it put us into a new spot. We were able to, to spin up a company almost overnight, a consulting business, that we had, was, we had where we had to turn away business. Uh, what was interesting about this is that we had, through a series of accidents, found ourselves with a structure that had... that, that replicated luck. It actually uh, systematized a kind of serendipity over and over and over again. And we thought, so, I mean, What's interesting about it is that what we recognize through that experience is that, and, and what's really interesting about Serial Bar is that any number of Silicon Valley companies, partnerships, all sorts of interesting things actually arose out of Serial Bar and the interactions that it created. So much like the discussion that Lizzie was having earlier about Walk and Wine, it was a space that enhanced or enabled serendipity, uh, in our case, very specific to a certain type of industry, uh, the web industry, which had very specific effects in that industry that in some ways are st still being felt today. By, by the way, this was the the serial bar graph we ended up with, which you, observed power law distribution. People, people like Chris Bix, they um, do. surprisingly. Uh, so, so we thought about this. We thought about you know, what's, what's going on in that environment. If we want to understand how to make luck more systemic and more systematic, if we want to figure out how to embed it more in our processes, um, what we have to recognize is that it's not just uh, dumb luck that's operating here, right? There's obviously some degree of intent, some degree of intent uh, some degree of purpose that's been built into this experience that enables these kind of serendipitous encounters. Um, so we have a new definition of serendipity as something that is more than just blind luck. We think of serendipity as what happens when chance interacts with creativity. I think recognizing both sides of that equation is really important. Um, now I'd love to claim responsibility for that definition um, and maybe uh, I will eventually. But right now I have to admit <laughs> that it, it belongs to it belongs to a, a neurologist named James Austin. So James Austin, um, back in the 60s, had some major developments um, curing various uh, brain diseases. Um, and in the 70s, he decided to write a memoir. And he, he, looking over his career and the major breakthroughs that led to his success, he kept coming, ac down to, kept coming ac across one basic idea, which was that um, the breakthroughs in each case led to chance, or were, were based on chance. Um, and being a scientist, he wanted to understand this. Now scientists for, through the ages have talked about chance being a critical component of discovery. Um, Pasteur, for instance, or, or uh, Sir Fleming discovering uh, antibiotics. Uh, but he wanted to come up with a more rigorous framework. So he, did, he did, ended up defining four kinds of luck. Uh, I'll go through them very quickly. The first kind of luck is blind luck. We like blind luck because it's, you know, you have to admit that occasionally, without you know, choice or incident, shit does kind of just sort of happen. The second kind of luck, though, it actually involves human ac action. Uh, and this is general exploratory motion. So the idea of that moving around actually produces collisions that can be productive. The third kind of luck is what he called sagacity. And this was um, what Pasteur meant when he was talking about um, chance favoring the prepared mind. This means that understanding an area meant that you would be more likely to identify things that, in chance, that would be useful to you. And the fourth kind of luck is really kind of interesting and bizarre, and even Dr. Austin has a hard time explaining it, but it, he describes it as the individualized action. And these are the idiosyncrasies, the weird habits or hobbies or obsessions that you as an individual have that leads you to see things that absolutely nobody else would have seen, because you were able to put peanut butter and chocolate together. What happens, in a sense, when you immerse yourself so deeply in something that you get to a place that uh, no one has ever really gotten to before? That's right. 
And the nice thing about this framework that Austin put together is once you understand that luck is not, that luck in each of those, with the exception of blind luck, there is a very specific human element, there's a very specific human component, which means that, theoretically at least, we can create a framework that allows us to, again, accelerate um, luck and serendipity and our ability to perform within it. Um, so we can actually throw gasoline on luck itself. So what's interesting about... Sounds dangerous, doesn't it? That's, yes, that's... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to step you back. You step back, you step back. Um, <laughs> so what's interesting about uh, what Austin did is that when he recognized... You know, there's, there's a section in his book, which I would highly recommend. It's called Chase, Chance, and Creativity. Uh, there's a section in it where he recognizes, he starts to understand that, in fact, luck has played this critical component in making his work meaningful, right? That without, this serendip without these serendipitous occurrences, uh, as he's defined them in his framework. None of his work would ever have had the meaning. He wouldn't have been able to reach the heights or, or seen the breakthroughs or had the breakthroughs that he did. Um, and what's so interesting about this is that in scientific practice, serendipity is, to a large extent, actually recognized as a part of the practice. We were looking at this, and we were thinking that's really interesting um, because uh, theoretically, then, we should be able to construct a similar framework or figure out how to apply that framework to the world of business. We should be able to say, in business interactions, within business processes, in the way that we operate businesses, large and small, we should be able to encourage, create, and account for similar acts of serendipity, similar acts of breakthrough. And arguably, if we were doing this well, we could gauge the health or the well-being of a business based on how frequently or how often or how well or how large those serendipitous occurrences were. There's a problem, though, a small problem, and that is that companies are designed to prevent the unexpected, right? We're obsessed with predictability and risk management. Uh, there's a term for this, uh, this problem of trying to inject more serendipity into a scaled organization uh, that we call this the double bind. Now, you may be familiar with the term of the double bind. Basically, it's a lose-lose proposition, two messages that uh, contradict one another, sort of like when Singapore, after 40 years of totalitarian rule, telling its citizens what to do and when, uh, starts an ad campaign to be spontaneous. <laughs> so we have the same problem with organizations, and really developing the practices to encourage uh, and amplify serendipity, um, they, they have to take this into account. We have to find ways that actually uh, unbind the company. So we wanted to talk about these five. So we have five ways, sort of five frames, as we started to think about this, that we'd like to share with you on how we can start to introduce serendipity and serendipitous practices, or rather practices that encourage or enable serendipity inside organizations. Um, and the first of these, very simply, is the concept of connectivity. And connectivity, unsurprisingly, is about being connected to as many things as possible. So the question is, how do we insert ourselves or how do we structure environments so that we can create the maximum number of connections possible? Um, and the best example I've seen of this actually comes from the industry that we work in, uh, the, the sort of web startup industry. Uh, and this is a photo of it. It's a place in San Francisco called Dogpatch Labs. Um, so if you spend any time in the internet industry, you'll see that different companies, different web startups have different cycles of growth. Uh, they start off as just an idea, and then it's a couple of people hacking around on an idea, and then eventually that idea hits or has some sort of resonance with a market, at which point frequently it can get funded, and then it can go turn into Google or Facebook or whatever's going to happen or to it. Or crash and burn. Right, that too. Not that that has ever happened to us. Um, <laughs> That's another talk. So... so uh, so that first step, that first step, the first part when it's just uh, two people, two or three people, and they have an idea and they've just started working on it. It's a really interesting time. It's a really exciting and an innovative time. It's a place where there are far more things that are unknown than are known. And one of the ways that our industry has responded to that, uh, which was uh, sort of inculcated here at Dogpatch Labs, uh, but has since spread much further, is this concept of the accelerator. And so what happens is now when you have an idea and you know that you want to start a company and don't have much money, you rent a desk or maybe two desks at a place like Dogpatch Labs. And Dogpatch Labs is filled with any number of companies. At any given time, it'll have 25 or 30 different companies in this space. And it's hard to tell who they are or where they are. And they're constantly coming in, and they're moving out, and they're shifting around. Um, but what's so interesting about it is that it creates all sorts of things. It accelerates. It genuinely accelerates, surely through the, the act of being there and putting all of these people in the same place. It accelerates the opportunity that they all have to innovate. It helps them find people to talk to. It helps them find ways to create. It simply allows them to connect. 
and connect in ways that are meaningful to them personally, but also quite clearly professionally. And there are any number of companies that you've probably heard of or will soon hear of that have come out of this space. Who've literally gone from the, the garage, two founders in a garage, to 100 founders in an open warehouse. Right, because we've recognized that this idea of isolation that for so long, I think, has been one of the pinnacles of how we think about entrepreneurship is actually pretty much the opposite of what can make one successful. So the second idea is what we call motility. We really like boring biological terms for this sort of thing, unsurprisingly, I guess, since we stole it from science. Um, and motility is just the, uh, is the concept of sort of random movement, right? So picture a single-celled organism floating around in the primordial ooze just sort of flapping its flagella around. That's motility. <laughs> And motility is sort of the flip side of connectivity because it's not enough just to put yourself in an environment that allows you to connect. You also have to create reasons and opportunities to connect. So we think of motility very much as that. How can you structure or arrange an environment so that random, random encounters occur or not only just occur but are actively encouraged? And yes, most of them will go nowhere, but every once in a while, one of them will sort of strike a fire and have some meaning. So in the case of Dogpatch Labs, they do this any number of ways. There's, one of the things I love best about Dogpatch Labs is that there's no map, right? It's a huge open space with tons and tons of desks. But because the companies are constantly growing, or they're leaving, or they're coming, or they're showing up, or they're breaking apart, or they're merging together in strange, unusual, and surprisingly organic ways, uh, because of that, it's a pain in the ass. So they just stopped keeping a map. And one of the things that's happened as a result is there's a lot more talking at Dogpatch Labs than you might expect to find in an organization where people were so intent or so focused on the work that they were doing. And that's because the space requires it. If you want to find someone, you have to ask for them. So that's one of the ways, you know, along with all sorts of other things that they do. They encourage events, they encourage speaking, they create times or opportunities for different companies to present. All of these are just excuses to create movement, to create action that might possibly create friction and heat. By contrast, think about how uh, in most companies, sitting down is, a, is a, a, the um, icon of, of working, right? If you, if you aren't sitting down, you're, you know, you're screwing around, right? Um, but nobody, as somebody once said, nobody ever got lucky or nobody ever stumbled on anything sitting down. So stand up. <laughs> so as Pastor said, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. What did he mean? I don't know exactly what he meant, but I know that today... We know how we will appropriate it. <laughs> as we do. Uh, but I, I know that today, the prepared mind means being able to put together ideas that are not obviously connected in novel ways. And, uh, and serendipity gives us the opportunity to do this. Um, by way of example, um, it gets, it gets satisfaction, the company we started, uh, was the result of a side project that came out of Serial Bar. Serial Bar uh, colliding people together, um, people taking pictures, pictures ending up on the internet. P people around the world seeing those pictures. Um, many of those pictures of us wearing uh, T-shirts with the names of local companies like, like Twitter or... Um, Bearing in mind that this is 2006 as all of the web stuff is just starting right. to come back but in this highly networked, highly connected way so that it wasn't just those of us in Silicon Valley who were participating, it was actually in a very real sense the entire world who was able to participate through the tools that we were building. Exactly, so this, this happens spontaneously. A local event spreads globally in pictorial form. People start asking, where can I get those cool uh, shirts with the logos on them? We, we had this crazy idea. We thought it would be a lot of fun to create a swag of the month club where people in Australia or London uh, or really down the street who didn't have the cool Twitter swag or uh, dogster swag could get it for a low monthly price of $14. And we put it up as a joke. It took off, and eight weeks later, we had 2,000 subscribers paying us on a monthly recurring basis. <laughs> just, just for the record, it turns out there's a huge fulfillment issue when you're trying to give away 2,000 pieces of free swag. Turns out that startups do not want to do that for you. But anyway. So we ended up with a huge customer service problem. <laughs> as you can imagine. And we had no experience with customer service, which in retrospect was probably a blessing because we were able to put together three observations almost simultaneously to come up with the idea for our business and to foresee what would eventually become social media. And those three things were we were associated personally with this business. And so if we didn't do good customer service, we were personally offending those customers. Two, we, were, we had a blog, 
people would talk to each other on the, in the comment section of our blog. We would answer their questions there. And often those questions were the same ones they were emailing us. Third observation, our customers would talk about us on their blogs. And we would respond on their blogs. We would go to our customers. So in a flash, these three observations came together. Similarly to how Fleming, Sir Fleming put together five observations to discover penicillin. Um, in a flash, this is often how it happens, and, uh, and saw the future of customer service, that it was going to be inside out, that customers were going to be at the center, not companies, and uh, that there was going to be a blurring of the personal and the professional. And, uh, and so this, was, this is an example of how um, the, creating a space for connecting things that aren't obviously connected can work. And there were several st structural things that we now have seen uh, work in other kinds of companies. Side projects, 20% um, time, like Google is famous for with its engineers. Um, and that's where they give the engineers, theoretically at least, one day a week to work on something, 20% of their time since they're engineers, to work on something that's different than the project that they're working on at present. Uh, we, we have something that gets satisfaction called a, the most interesting meeting in the world, which is a pitch meeting where you're graded only on how interesting your ideas are. And, uh, and so things like this, spaces that are, that are uh, sacred for um, connecting things that are not obviously connected. Next up, we have another concept we call porosity. And porosity is quite simply, um, you know, creating channels and connections between you or the organization that you're a part of and other people or other organizations. Uh, porosity is just about basically making the boundaries of your business or your organization fuzzy. Uh, so that things can come in and so that things can get out. The challenge with most, most companies is that you know, groups in general are defined not by who they have in them, but by who they keep out. Uh, and that's how we get a lot of the work done that we get done. Um, that said, there is, especially in a highly networked world like the one we live, in, live and work in now, uh, it's generally true, I think, that what matters to your business, what's most important to your business, is whatever's happening outside your business. Right, whether it's how your customers act or how your partners feel. Finding ways to actually structurally create those relationships so that that information can flow back and forth is critical in a world as wired as the one that we live in. Um, and the first, first time that we saw this in action uh, was with a bag company called Timbuktu that was an early user of Get Satisfaction's customer service software, which you know, allows their customers to sort of speak to, or, or allows their company to speak to their customers in a newer and more intimate way. And what we saw with Timbuktu that was so interesting was one day, uh, one, of their, uh, one of their customers, a longtime customer, a 35-year-old woman, uh, popped up on the message board and asked this question, which was, does Timbuktu make a diaper bag? So it's a super simple question. And, they got a, and she got, I think, a great answer from the company. They said, no, we don't make a diaper bag, and here's why. We're a messenger bag company. We think of our core customers, and we have for the last 10 years that we've been in business, we think of our core customers as bike messengers. And so the people that we're trying to serve, the products that we're trying to make, are the kinds of products that serve bike messengers, which is a completely reasonable response. It actually suggests that the company has a strong sense of identity, a strong sense of brand, and is trying to sort of parlay that into the world. What's more interesting is the response that they got from the woman on the blog. She said, OK, I get that. I appreciate that even. That's fine. Here's the thing, though. I'm 35 now, but when 10 years ago when you started and I became a loyal customer, I was a 25-year-old bike messenger. Now I'm 35 and I'm a mom. <laughs> and I don't want to have to stop buying your bags. I still think of myself as a Timbuktu customer. A core part of my identity is still being a bike messenger, but I'm older now and I have a different set of needs. And what was so fantastic about this is that it absolutely changed the way that Timbuktu thought about itself as a company. It made the organization recognize that they could expand their sense of who they were, that in fact the actions that they had taken and the things that they had done allowed them to expand the sense of who they were. That in a very real sense they could build on top of that success. Right. And um, long story short, they do in fact now make a diaper bag. <laughs> Finally, we want to talk about this one last concept. Um, we call directionality. Um, most, of, you know, most of when we talk about luck and the role of luck and serendipity inside organizations, most of what we focus on is the concept of chance. And that's because chance is kind of the sticky, squishy thing that most organizations don't want to admit is actually sort of a compelling, compelling and important part of their process. The unknowable. The unknowable. Um, and that is true. It is unknowable. It is, I suppose, Brene Brown would say, a little bit about being vulnerable. Um, but the reason that you can, as an organization, whether you're Timbuktu or any organization, the reason that you can allow chance in, the reason that you can structure an opportunity for something like that, is really simple. 
The way that you do it is you have directionality, which really boils down to just having a very strong point of view. Uh, Brene Brown actually has a quote about this. She likes to say that a strong point of view, a strong point of view is worth 80 IQ points. Um, <laughs> and a way to think about this is that uh, we talked about motility, which is really about moving. It's about raw movement, even random movement. We saw that at Serial Bar. We had no particular direction. We were just open to ra the random creative collisions that would occur. Uh, but once we had stumbled on our big idea, our big aha, then we actually had purpose. And from that point on, things accelerated. And they accelerated because of this factor, this directionality. Um, so we decided we were going to build a product. But that takes time, and we didn't want to wait. So we immediately started making lots of noise about this. Um, we, we booked ourselves in conferences. We, um, we started coining terms and blogging, and pretty much let the entire world know, know what we were doing. Now, this is in contrast to, uh, at the time, it was accepted wisdom in the startup world, which is, you know, protect your idea. Um, have a big launch. Uh, you don't want people stealing your, your, you know, secret ideas before you're ready, right? Um, it's a really defensive crouch. Um, so part of directionality is exposing your direction to others. And as a result of, in our case, uh, being out and about and being very vocal, we were introduced to people who, are, who knew far more about customer service than we did, people who were doing completely unrelated things but had an impact on how we designed our product. And uh, in fact, one of, one of the people we, we were introduced uh, early on was, was Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, one of the largest um, online shoe companies in the world. And uh, he became our first customer. So directionality accelerates the role of chance and the, your ability to um, make use of it because you have a, you're connecting things towards that purpose. So in a very real sense, I think what we're saying at the end of the day is that success is a result of having a strong point of view and working very hard to get there and letting whatever might fall as it may along the way. That's kind of what we got for you. Go forth and get lucky. Thanks.